All right, welcome to the CEN Show, a platform where we learn from the world community. I am your host, Rosky Mascani. We have this evening our panel is Doc, Brother Doctor, Professor Amin Ra, Brother E, Historian Joe Hembrick, Brother DX, and our guest is CJH Moore, which is an author of a new book. Brother uh, Moore, can you tell us the name of your new book? Yeah, my new book is Opportunity, subtitle, The Largest Cash Heist in American History. Okay, so- It was a cash heist. Okay, okay so, go ahead. So you were on last week. This is part two. And we're, we're starting yes. last week. So I'm going to let you go ahead and, and uh, say what you want to say. So go ahead. Okay, well, thank you. Thanks for handing it off to me. And again, I'd like to thank all the guests for showing up today, the higher powers, uh, and, and anyone who's listening. And I want to thank you for your support from the past and all those uh, views that you did uh, look at and uh, you commented on. Now, I want to start from here because I think the soliloquy is very important in this book. Uh, Shakespeare wrote, wrote soliloquies in all his plays except King Lear. I decided to write a soliloquy in this book so you can hear Alan Pace's, the mastermind's thoughts, how he really felt about everything. And I'm going to have Brother Doctor read it to you, the soliloquy, uh, because he did it so eloquent, eloquently off the air. Oh, Brother Doctor, can you go ahead? Okay. With the penultimate blown through, Alan returned to his seat at the counselor's table. In a rare state of mind, he lost all contact with his surroundings and deeply thought to himself, to have or to have not? That is a question to be answered by all of us. An opportunity appears, then leaves in an instant. Gone forever, lost in the vice grip of time. Time could be sweet, are sluttish, but opportunities appear every so often, maybe once in a lifetime, and then again, never. We learn, we grow, we sleep, we die, and in learning and growth, do we put ourselves above others or share the fruits of our talent and build nests and teds for the weary. Dreams they came and went of friends, foe, and all people. Plans for the future are no plans for an insolent-minded drug. Yeah, there is a stew, for in that lifetime, dreams have come and gone. And when dreams are no more, the proud will devour, our, will devour the dreamless, for whom would consider time to waste or to use. Time is forever to the dreamless and time gives way to the dreamer. So the dreamer spurns not and accepts the fate of his actions. Patient is the stuff that we unworthily know not of and, has, and his actions may take quest by his own words, by his own actions. Hello? Damn. And now, uh, are there any uh, more questions, gentlemen? I have Hello? Brother DX, you want to go ahead? No, I'm good right now. Okay. I'm, I'm trying to learn a little bit more about the book. I'm listening. Okay. Okay, and I'll tell you all I can about it. But I'm going to respond to the questions. This is not a lecture. I'm going to respond to what you asked me. Okay, I have a question. You want to take mine? Sure. I'll take any question in the universe right now. Okay, was somebody in the process of take uh, asking a question before I interrupt? It? No. I have a question. What are you asking me? 
Okay, I'm listening. Hey, this is my question in the book now. Now, which wife? Because let's kind of go back. It was either Mark's or Alan's wife, the one that told him said, "Hey, the guys that he picked, nobody never got in trouble. Nobody ever went to jail. Nobody faced time." She told him, "Hey, basically, you picked the wrong crew because nobody can hold their mug. Because remember, they uh, they had a deal." You know, hey, if anybody get caught, hey, don't say nothing. Don't tell anybody else and your family. Because you got you got $20 million. You got $20 million. Nobody's going right. to tell. But, and he started getting worried at the end. And the wife pointed out, hey, man, you know, nobody ever did time. My thing is, yeah, you know, you don't, you don't plan one of the biggest crime heists in history with, with nobody that never been to jail. That's That's kind of stupid to me, man. <laughs> because, oh, oh you okay. Know, now, brother, like, doctor. You know, yeah. So explain that to me. Good work, and I hear what you're saying. Now, uh, Mark, that was Mark's wife. In the book, Mark married Flo. Uh, her her uh, long name is Florence. Okay, and they call her Flo for short. Uh, Alan never got married. He never got married. He had a girlfriend and a child by a lady, but he didn't marry her. But Mark married Florence. Florence was the one who told Mark that these guys are not seasoned criminals. And they weren't. They were all childhood friends of Alan. Alan was a mastermind. He wanted this to happen. So he talked everybody else into it. And they had a meeting once. They had uh, several meetings. They went to church. They had meetings outside of the church. They had meetings outside of, of the jobs they had as security guards. These guys were close-knit. They did everything together, even made love to women together, it, 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 as you can see it in the book. You read the book. Now, Alan was the mastermind. He was the key. Why was he the key? Because he worked at the Dunbar facility for two years and he was taking notes on how he could take the money but he needed help from knew all the employees because he was the head security guy so he knew where everything was he knew where the recordings was. He, he knew the uh, personality of his bosses and his underlings and everything. So he was a mastermind. That's why they got away with it. Uh, and he knew how long it was going to take to get about $18.9 million that was recorded. And you'll find in the book that Mark knew that it was more than that. But that's what they recorded. Uh, and he needed six people in order to do it. Now, that was a mastermind. See, he had five people at first, and he brought somebody in the last day because it was a surprise. Uh, he was going to get fired from his job. Uh, his boss wanted the keys today, and it was a Friday when he called him. He said, give me the keys. Uh, you're fired. And Alan said, you gave him an excuse. He said he's having a party, that he was real busy. Could he turn the keys in on Monday? So everything was set into motion at that point. So he called Henry up and told Henry to go get the uh, the U-Haul truck. And everybody uh, was already at the party. So he called Mark and said his own. So everybody knew everything at the last minute. They didn't know exactly when they were going on September 12, 1997 but they knew they already had the meeting. They knew they already had the meetings. So uh, now when they had these meetings, they had a scale. Alan made a scale of the whole joint. So everybody knew exactly what they were supposed to be doing. Uh, the only problem they had when they went in there was somebody got greedy. It was probably Henry in the book. And he took money that he wasn't supposed to take with the, with the bad rappers on him. Alan told him once he saw him pick up a, a bad money bag. He said, put that back. 
And then Henry said, no, I'm not putting it back. I'm getting all this money. And Mark tried to back up Allen by saying, why don't you play your position? Why don't you follow uh, what we did, what we planned? And he said, I don't listen to, uh, and this is the words, exactly the words he said in the book. I don't listen to that nigga. You okay? Uh, I do what I want to do. Okay. Now, so, you know how we speak to one another. So, uh, now, he put all that bad money in there. Allen didn't know it was in there until they started counting it. It took them, they never counted all the money. They never counted it all because it was too much. They even got counting machines and they still didn't count all the money. So what they did was move it around. They moved it out to uh, Lancaster and, and, and that area because Mark's grandmother uh, moved out there for a little while. She was deeply in the church and they went out there and counted it and they counted it in Compton. They counted it in Carson. And the, uh, the first night, that uh, they counted it. They couldn't believe it, man. These guys were ecstatic. They said, look at all this money. See, but they didn't know what to do with it. They knew how to get it, but after they got the money, they didn't know how to plan it as a group. Now, Alan knew what he was doing because he started the business, and it was uh, successful, a million-dollar business. He started it. But the other guys didn't know, like Henry uh, and, 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 and Mark really didn't want to do it in the first place. So they were uh, not on the same page as far as what they were going to do with the money after they received the money. So that's why Henry, uh, as I said last week, they went to Vegas and laundered it. They even tried to send money over the wire. They didn't know that uh, over $10,000 that the FBI would be looking at that money. You know, uh, they would be following it. So they, they got it that way, too. They got them. So they got them two ways, uh, the wire and the money wrappers. Okay. Brother, I'm done with that one. I hope I answered it. Brother Doctor? Hello? Can you guys hear me? Yeah. I can I can hear you. Okay, so I was gonna ask, ask Brother Doctor, did he was that a sufficient answer for him? But he's not coming through. So Calvin? Yes, sir. Okay, I want to go to page 86 and Okay. I want you to respond to this. Sure. This is the third paragraph on page 86. And I'm just going to read some of it. It says, I don't like credit, said Alan. Credit is a form of slavery, and our people have been in slavery far, far too long. Can you respond to that? <laughs> yeah, thank you. I sure can. See, Alan was clean. Uh, slavery. Lee, I mean, uh, credit leaves a paper trail. He knew this. He was a mastermind for a reason. The only reason they got he got caught because the other guys wanted to do their own thing. So he never put anything in his name, houses, and he had all the money. Uh, he just wanted to start the business. That's why he uh, thought the way he did and, and gave the soliloquy. He just wanted to start the business. And he didn't want anybody else to get out of line and start being extravagant and wanting more than what they can afford. Because we know that those brothers uh, had security jobs. Allen had a security job, but it was a high dollar security guy, security job. It was high dollar. So uh, he wanted to lay low and they didn't lay low because the girlfriend of one of the guys in the group wanted to be extravagant. She wanted to be flamboyant. She wanted to show the world uh, how she really wanted to live her life. 
So now, excuse me, the credit. Can Jack, can I answer, Jack? Yeah, sure you can. Okay, so so now, this was before. This is page eighty eighty six. This is way before it happened. Not way before, but before it happened. And basically, yeah. basically, Mark was being skeptical because he was yes. he was telling him maybe you know we shouldn't do this. And then he said that, right. that on page eighty five, he said our business is doing okay. But Alan was trying, and it was Alan was trying to convince him. And this is why he said that, you know, because Mark was saying we can get credit. He like, no, you know, he said he didn't like credit. He said credit was a form of slavery. And what attracted me to that was back when I was doing a little writing, because I I used to uh want to sing reggae songs and you know get into music a little bit because I enjoyed reggae so much. And I wrote okay. a song called Share Crop Cards. And that's what I, I basically was saying that that uh credit was a form of sharecropping. So that kind of took I kind of took interest to that and, and I wanted to see how you know you would respond to that. But but you can continue. Okay, to very good. Now with, now with, I want to say something else about it. Yes. Okay. And and I know we're having a conversation and we can't see one another because body language gives cues what you can when they when to interject and when not to interject. When you're having a phone conversation, you really can't coordinate well. If you can't you don't have any visual. But credit, if you really look at credit, and this is my personal view of credit, when you buy something on credit, you can get it right now. But can you really support what you're getting? In other words, do you have the money? A lot of people do not have the money. That's why their uh, FICO scores get out of whack. They can't handle money. They want something and they see it, they say, I got this credit card. Now, a lot of people end up cutting up their credit card. I don't know the statistics, but it ruins a lot of people. Credit costs more. When you get something on credit, it costs more if you pay cash for it. Now, if you have the cash and go in and say, I want this Lamborghini, okay? <laughs> and a Lamborghini costs 60000 100000 however much they cost. A guy with the cash, and I saw this in a movie once, a guy with the cash, he can go in and get it for $5,000 less, maybe even 10000 But if you get it on credit, it's going to cost 10000 more than what it really uh the the manufactured retail price it's going to cost more so credit uh, yeah. it, it's good it's good and it also leaves a paper trail uh, yeah. if you have seen any fbi movie as soon as somebody uses a car they know exactly where they are they can be in london they can be in uh uh, uh asia they can be uh in in, in arab the arabic countries the FBI knows that number. They know who, where you are. And, and I'm an uh, advocate of, uh, of the born supremacy. I like, I like the way that was written because it tells you as soon as you put a number in something, the FBI knows exactly where you are within the next 10 minutes. Okay? But uh, uh, I just want to say this. You know, there's really no such thing as credit. What you're doing is buying money. And that's what uh, you were saying, Calvin. It costs more because you, yeah. you're paying somebody to buy it for you and they're charging you interest. And they exactly. want to know not would you buy things that are uh, like a house and they, they can come get that or a car, but will you pay money back that you borrow? So you bought 10 grand, would you pay that back? And that's how, you know, uh, the economics, that's how economics are back. And, and Michael Jordan have, has a stake. These guys were great athletes, but how many black owners do we have out there? How many? I don't see very many. If you did your research, you would see that we play ball, but we don't own ball. We don't own any teams. 
And those athletes that play are looked up. They are icons in our community, the black community. They're icons, and everybody want to be like them. And in fact, when when uh, some when uh, some guy comes up in the black community, say he could even be a pimp, and he drives around in a big Cadillac and has has all these flashy clothes. The kids want to be just like them. Okay, but what we need to do uh, is do it the American way. Go to school, get an education, and uh, play it by the book. And I know that rules were made to be broken. Of course, a lot of people, the corrupt politicians, break them all the time. But you got to know when to break a rule. You got to go to school and get that education. If you don't get the education, you got to learn from somebody. And where are you going to learn from? Your own culture, your own uh, place where you live, because that's who you hear every day. That, that, that their wisdom becomes your teacher, and then. Uh, your wisdom becomes their wisdom, okay? Their wisdom becomes your your wisdom. Because I remember at one time back in the South, they wouldn't even let you into college, okay? So uh, you just need the education, that's all, the American education, all right? And so when you go to school, what you should think about is learning what's important, I think, to everybody, especially those in the uh, black community and that's underprivileged. I think that you should learn how to read and how to count. You don't have to write uh, like a lot of people do, uh, but you got to learn how to count. You got to count your money. That's scientific. When you leave the ATM, if you drew a uh, hundred dollars out, you better make sure you have a hundred and uh, you want to know how to read what somebody else is writing down. In other words, you want to communicate. You want to communicate because this communication presents a problem. You don't understand. If you don't understand what the uh, professor is saying, and, and you are a professor, Ra, uh, Amin Ra, and then you can't give the students good grades, okay? I hope I answered the question. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, do uh, have Brother E? Brother E, have you asked any questions? No, I have not. I'm just listening. I have not read the book, so I, I don't have no questions at the moment. Okay. Thank you. Brother Hembrick? Yes, sir. I have a couple of questions, comments. Uh, I haven't read the book, uh, but from what I've been hearing, it seems like some of this stuff is taken from the movie called Dead Presidents, uh, when they robbed uh, this place and then, you know, people started flossing and buying Cadillacs and giving away money and got them busted. But anyway, my question to you is, why would you use a, 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 a soliloquy from from a European Shakespeare? That's one question. And okay, well, let me tell you right now, before you go on, let me answer that. Because I know you got some good questions, and sometimes they can be uh, annoying and aggravating. But it's a good question. Uh, Shakespeare was probably, if you read my book, he's probably black. I don't care if he was in Europe or not. Shakespeare, I think, I believe he was black personally. Because he wrote about Othello. He wrote about the Moors. He wrote about black people. He had a black woman. He wrote about the... Huh? I understand. I know that. I know all that you said. Okay, so he's probably black himself. Probably. Okay? I believe he was black. So that's why I wrote about a European Shakespeare. Okay, go ahead. I'm listening to the other question. Uh... Uh, but about the movie Dead Presidents. I don't know if you saw that. Oh, okay. Have you? Have I what? In the movie I Dead. didn't hear it. Oh, yeah, I saw it. Sure. Same kind of thing. And I believe it was a good movie. I believe it was a good movie. Now, these guys went in and they painted their faces white or they wore white 
uh, masks, and and they plan this uh, to 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 do this. But I believe that none of them were involved in the company, and the money they stole was uh, was peanuts compared to what Allen stole. That's it was not- on the same thing, but the, the culture, the culture, what I'm talking about, when a certain uh, people get money, they can't handle it. The money handles them. In other words, I wrote once, the tail should, shouldn't should wag the dog. The dog should wag the tail. The only part of the so, movie, can I finish? The I only, beg your pardon? The only part of the movie I'm making reference to a dead president mm-hmm. When the uh, the brother that was a preacher started flossing, buying Cadillac, and giving away dollars, talking about the Lord. yeah, that's, that's the part I'm talking about. The next- okay, but uh, as I said, uh, I I made a, a reference to that, a point to that. Brothers can't handle money; we, we they aware. can't handle it. Understand? Okay. The next. What am I saying? You saying black people don't know? Money. I, I know that before what I read. Oh, okay. Now, good, that's- good. But that's all it is. And and you can make a thousand movies. It's gonna come out the same in the end. It's all gonna come out in the watch. You wanna you get a lot of money, you wanna go out and buy something. Okay, good, because you're never used to having it in the first place. Right. Or you can't lay low. You can't drive a Volkswagen. You gotta go out and buy a Cadillac. That's the point. I when the Volkswagen can take you around just like the the, uh, uh, the Cadillac can, but the Cadillac attract other things like women and prestige and ego and all that. I know what I got. What do you got you know, in that type of situation? That's what gives us problems. Even with all the murders and all that stuff that we be doing out there, because we got big egos, we got pride. Pride for what? You got to handle this money. And buy it. It facilitates things. So we just got to learn how to handle the money. And uh, we don't have uh, a course. They don't have a course in Harvard for black people to learn uh, to handle money. Harvard is the oldest institution, higher educational institution in this country, in North America. It was established in 1636. It's the oldest. It's an Ivy League school, and what they uh, uh, what their fort is is medicine, law. Okay, medicine and law. Oh, they're great in that. But I, I went to Gonzaga, okay, and they had a great philosophy well, department. I I don't think it was any uh, uh, department in the country in the country that was better than that. But I've never been to all the schools, but. In their philosophy department, I flourished. I listened. I took notes. And I got good grades at Gonzaga. In philosophy, I got a B. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, you know, this is uh, – Brother Ra, I can't hear you. I see your lips moving. But anyway, oftentimes, Calvin, when you – excuse me, Mr. Moore, when you run off on these rants, I oftentimes have to remind you you know who you're talking to when you go over. Oh, oh, yeah, Joe. Yeah, I know who I'm talking to. I'm talking to Joe Hambert, the greatest historian on the face of the planet. That's not, who I'm talking to. Not on the face of the planet, but you know, you know, you ran. But you're a good one. Can, can I finish? And talking? I don't go off on rants. I don't go off on rants. I know where I'm going. I got a path. A rant is somebody that don't know where they're going. Okay. Think. Okay, uh... Hey, bro- brother C.J. H. Moore, can you let uh, Mr. Henry, uh, historian, finish his point, please, so we can move on? Okay. Now, who I can barely hear you. See, that's why. Uh, that's why we uh, uh, the audio, the the visual is good. I can barely hear you on the phone. What did you just say? I said, can you let the brother finish his point so we can move on? 
Oh, well, yeah, I'm letting him finish his point. He can say anything he wants. But I'm just telling him I'm not ranting. But go ahead and finish your point. Go ahead, Brother Joe. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, my next point was about these friends that got involved in the heist. Uh, I just want to mention the percent of us who are who have gotten locked up is because we were following a friend. I don't need you to comment on that. And my last point, and I'm going to let it go, is when you mentioned these black sports icons owning these teams, they don't own the teams. They own a percentage of the teams. And it's usually pretty small. That's what I said, Joe. I said they don't. The black icons don't own the teams. See, that's why it's hard. See, when you are in a lecture, and I used to like them when I was in college, you have to listen to the professor. You have to listen to who's speaking. I don't care if he's not a professor. He can be a dude off the street. Listen to him. I said, these icons, we hold them high as icons, but they don't own teams. Now, go ahead. I'm saying that. I'm going to go ahead, Joe. I'm through. And uh, I got a couple of points, Rashi You know, you know, you know. Um, throughout our history as an African people, there were black people that knew how to handle money. C.J. Walker, his brother named Peabody, who uh, 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 who opened up a shipping business and then opened up schools during the Holocaust of enslavement. You had Frederick Douglass, you know, who operated the Free Man Bureau, and uh, 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 they, uh, you know, made a lot of money. The same thing with uh, uh, Motown, Barry Gordy, and uh, and, and Johnson with Ebony. Uh, there are a lot of black people that didn't go to school that learned that, that knew how to handle money. Now, getting back to this picture, these were young cats. Yeah, and yeah, they, they were, were. And, and they were, they were, you know, they they had their fractions. I mean, uh, philosophical or personal uh, challenges with each other. Money changes. When you get the money, you want your cut, and you don't want nobody telling you how to spend it. You know, anybody that's been in, you know, low level lumping and hustling, you know, people say, "Man, give me my money, and you can't tell me what to do with it." And some of them didn't know how to handle women. You know, some of them chose the wrong women in the book, you know. And then, I mean, because, you know, you if you ain't in control, you know, you're going to get lost if you're letting somebody else drive the car, you know. You know I mean? They, may, so, they like, might run into a brick wall. Okay, yeah, I, I, I hear you. Well, they ran them to the penitentiary. They ain't just going to a brick wall. You know, <laughs> so, so, so my point is, is that, you know, um, uh, even Bumpy Johnson out in New York and things of this nature, yeah. he, he was a gangster. We had a lot of them people in Washington, D.C. and things of this nature. They made money off drugs. They made uh, many of our parents and, and friends in the South made money off moonshine, jute box, jute joints. They opened up stores and stuff. Now, they didn't make a bunch of money because they couldn't sell the whites. But, you know, it's it's, it's an issue with these young brothers. Um, they, yes, it was. They, even though the brother that led them uh, was very smart about getting the money. Yeah. They should have been talking about how they was going, what they was going to do once they got the money before they did it. And you know that's, that's uh, true. And, and do and do and and then at the same time they did make a pledge, don't snitch. You understand? Uh, we'll take care of your family. Oh, well, okay, that's that's that that's good to a cat that uh, you know uh, who, who have some con consciousness and 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 some understanding that you know you follow directions. If you don't follow directions. You know, everybody has to follow directions. I'm 75. I follow directions. If you're going to use hair grease, you got to read the bottle and they'll tell you how to do it. So the issue is, is that these were, many of them were young brothers. They had, some of them had good jobs, as you pointed out. But they did, they were not, and that's why that woman said, 
He's ain't seasoned criminal. He's just a young That's right. And because you know what? She's been around him. She know cats that's criminal because she had been around him and not from TV. You understand? You, 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 it, it, it's, it's, it's um, but they couldn't, they were in a complex situation, a paradox, because they, you know, they couldn't talk to other people. They couldn't not, but they should have been able to uh, understand how to deal with it after the fact. Because, you know, and they did, they did some good things. Don't get me wrong. They didn't do everything bad. But, so, you know, uh, it's not fortunate that they had to go to the penitentiary somewhere. Let me let me get in here on this, Professor Rob. Yeah. Let me let me just say this statement. Power supersedes monetary success for, for, for people of color. Do y'all agree with that? What, what, what did you say? I said power, power supersedes. supersedes. I, I, I'll repeat it. Power supersedes black or people of color monetary success. Do you, do you agree with that? Well, well, power, first of all, you got to define power. But go ahead, go ahead, well, go ahead. I'm, right. I'm saying power is, and I, this is where I want to bring Brother DX in here. Brother DX, you here? Yes, sir. Professor Ra was describing how that how blacks were successful with handling their money. So Brother okay. DX is a descendant of uh, Black Wall Street. Is that correct, Brother DX? Yes, sir, that is correct. So this is where this is where I, I came from with I said power supersedes monetary success for 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 uh, black people or people of color. So Brother DX can you kind of go get where I'm going from there? Yeah, in a certain degree. Yeah. Um, you say power supersedes monetary success, success. Of, of the monetary success of black people or people of color. I, um, actually, I think it's just the opposite. You know why? Because when we get money, to us, the money is power. But to the other races, power is power. And generally, when they get to a certain level of wealth, they get bored and they they get power. They run for politics. They, you know. Okay, so I I'd rather, I'd rather you know, what I'm saying, be the lawyer than the the athlete. You know what I'm saying? Well, like, this, who really has the power? <laughs> come on, baby. This is where I'm going with this. Uh, Black Wall Street was very successful. Is that correct, Brother DX? Yes, sir. We all know the history. So, what happened to it? It got destroyed by the ones in power. That's what I'm talking about. Right. No matter, no matter right. how, no matter how successful we become monetarily, the power structure can take it away from you. That's my point. Yes, that's definitely true. That that's what I point. you know what? So we in agreement because like I said, we rather have the money than the power. Well, you know? well, how do how do we get power when these dudes have these nuclear missiles? Well, okay. gonna... It doesn't matter if they have the nuclear missiles if we <laughs> holding the button. Okay, fundamentally, uh, that's how you get power. Uh, a, B, C, D, and then, like I was saying earlier, you got to get the education. You're an American education. You have to get it. There's no way around it. So you, you do what you have is, to do. It's a prison and industrial system. American education yeah. is, is part of the spell because we've learned their language, we've learned how they think, we've learned their process of capitalism, when ultimately we, we, that's not the formula for humanity because you see where okay. it's taking us. Yeah, but that's American. I said American education because you know, the federal the government got it going on. Okay. The who? Federal government. They have power. Uh, they out of here, bro. They, 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 they only lasted about 400 years out of here, bro. And they couldn't have done it without okay. it. Well, you're right about that. But it there, mean it's uh, because we're not in Congress, because we're not a part of the Senate, you know, because we're not, you know what I'm saying, directly engaged in international affairs where we can, you know, truly bring about peace and love upon the earth. We know these folks bringing destruction. So what do you think we okay. have in our neighborhoods? 
You know what I'm saying? We're going to have destruction. we looking for the, it's like we looking for the overseer to take his neck off of us when the overseer is designed to put his neck on us. You know, that's yes. what they're designed to do. You can't go and ask the lion for forgiveness when he eating a gazelle because that's what the lion do. Yes. Yes, that's true. So now if we can see, see this and, and, and you're right, I'm not backing off uh, uh, anything. I'm supporting you with that. That's see, good. but it's a complex, it's a complex situation. First, you have to uh, learn their ways and do it the way that needs to be done in order to gain the power. I beg to differ. Because in any in any conquering situation, like when they come to conquer, they conquer and they bring their ways and eliminate your ways. You know what I'm saying? We already know what the ways are. All the ways are ancient. The, the, the ways of healing, the ways of governing our communities and our societies. You know what I'm saying? The sages and some of us, we know what to do. It's just a matter of putting ourselves in the position to execute that. You know what I mean? Yeah, you know, like right. you talk about the ball players, if they didn't have the mentality to agree to play, there wouldn't be no there would be no owners. But they agreed to play. Right. They said, I will do this for you for this amount, whatever that amount is. And they said, I will do this, I'll give up my body or whatever the case. You know, saying just like in the days of slavery, we say, well, you know what, don't whip me, I'll pick your cotton. You know, but it was the tools and few that said, I don't care what you do. You try to whip me, I'm going to hit you back. You know, it was like Malcolm X and, and Martin Luther King. Either you going to sit at the diner and get beat over the head, or you can go across the street and shop in our own stores and our own uh, uh, situations that we was building at that time. And we still got our own. But the, the patronization of collectively of what we actually need as opposed to what you think you want, two totally different things. So yeah, we it, it, it's, money over power right now. They go hand in hand. Okay. Money and power go hand in hand. Most people with power, people think they're rich, and most people is rich think they, you know, people think they got the power. Power is to realize your will in opposition to others, and uh, you know, so you can impose, like your brother say, yeah, you know, you can have a diamond ring worth millions of dollars. Somebody can rob you and take it if they got a gun or they beat you up and take it. They do it all the time. That's what thievery and hustling is. These people steal countries. You understand why other people going in there shoplifting, getting a bunch of clothes. You understand? <laughs> it's, 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 it's a whole new different game when you talking about, and they print up money. These people are saying they are trillions of dollars in debt to themselves. Now, how are you going to pay yourself back? Oh, you're sense. right. That don't even make sense. You know, okay, so they, now, they Amin Ra, yeah. can I say this? Uh, if we had a print press in our garage, we wouldn't have to work in a nine to five. All we had to do is push a button. Now, they have a printing press. They have lots of printing presses around the country in what they call a mint. And I say the mint is their garage because they can go in there and print as much money as they want because there's nothing bagging it up. We, we were off the gold standard in 1933. No yeah, the, more gold the, back. The military and their army bags it up. Yeah, that's yeah. right. See, the power. Yeah, yeah. The Marines. Yeah, the Marines yeah, backed it up. So if you go to Fort Knox and try to take something out of it, they're going to call the National Guard. And if the National Guard don't work, they're going to call the Navy SEALs. If the Navy SEALs doesn't work, they're going to call the Marines. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, Y'all, hey, bro, this is a beautiful discussion. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Hey, let me go back to Brother E. Brother E, anything yet? No, no questions, no questions. Just paying attention. Hey, Brother E. Let me say this. This is your first time on. And thank you for showing up, man. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your no input. Problem. I no really problem. appreciate it. I really wholeheartedly. Because you bring us some good issues. And you don't always agree with people who think they know what they're talking about. Okay? That's like you didn't agree with me. That's good. I love it. No, that was brother. Okay? That was brother DX. I mean brother DX. Okay, that's who I'm talking about. Now, who's Brother E? Brother Doctor? 
no, nah, brother E is is another. He's a he's he's a historian Hendrix, folks, and he's been coming oh, okay. up with us lately. It's his first time on with you, but he's been coming oh, okay. up a lot. Did, did yeah, we hear uh, from brother E yet? Well, yeah, it just sounds like part of your book uh, where you're saying that uh, blacks didn't know what to do with money. It reminds me of a movie, uh, Goodfellas, you know, when they uh, done that lick and one of them started buying Cadillacs and stuff like that, brought the heat on them, you know. So it's, uh, I figure that's in a mm -hmm. lot of cultures, you know what I'm saying? They get that money and they want to buy right. things that, uh, you know, just not our people, I understand. Well, well, yes. See, but I talk about our people because I'm a black person. And I know okay. that my mother and father, my mother and father came from the South. Most of us went through the South. So we have Southern cultures and Southern beliefs and Southern superstitions. We have, uh, and we came through there. Uh, I was taught by my parents. Uh, and they didn't necessarily have a good education, but they were hard workers. My daddy worked for uh, the uh, city of L.A. as a trash man for 32 years and raised five kids. So he had to do it. He was used to working. That's good. I like that, you know, and I wanted to be just like him. But I was able to get a full scholarship to go play ball somewhere. And I happened to go to college and get a degree because of that. He couldn't pay for it because uh, – when uh, when I was going to school, and this is emotional for me, I was going to school. I went, I was going to Utah, and we went to Sears to get some clothes for me to go to school. So I picked out some clothes, not very many, picked out some stuff that I thought I'd like and I could wear, and I'd never been to the snow before. And the dude came back. He said, your credit card has insufficient funds. I felt bad because of that. I couldn't even get any new clothes to go to school. And we were talking about this uh, since I was 13, going to school, going to college. They wanted me to go to college. See, he didn't have the money. He just didn't have the money. That's okay. And he, and he worked. He had to be to work every morning at 6 a.m. So that means he was in bed by 9 o'clock, okay, for 32 years. He bought the house. He raised the family. He did all that. But he didn't have money for certain things like going to school and for other things. Uh, for the, the kids wanted some uh, a suit, uh, some for the prom, whatever we wanted. He just didn't have that money. But he paid his bills. He had he had, this is what he had. He had gold-plated credit. And when, when something messed with his credit, he went off. He paid his bills. But he was from the South. And he told me one time, when we were sitting down having a private conversation, father-son conversation, he said he knew more than his teachers knew. Okay? <laughs> but the work ethic is still there. Handling the money? Yeah, I know some people out there that can handle money. I know some people out there. Our our uh, culture built the pyramids. Our culture. Uh, Joe probably know this about the gold. The dude that gave out all that gold. You're the historian with Master Moose or somebody. Yeah, he could handle money. He changed entire economies with all the money he had. Of course, everybody. Uh, is not a culprit of not being able to handle money. Some do. But on the average, on the average, we have a problem handling money. We just do. We talk about it wrong. We don't put it in its proper place. We start loving it. And uh, we don't uh, help others with it. Uh, I, I know people, I, I know a girl that won't even give a desolate person a dollar. Sometimes. She thinks that she shouldn't give him anything. I don't think like that. If I see him out there and he's hungry, I'm going to give him a dollar and keep on going. See, it's handling the money. Okay, go ahead.
I had a millionaire friend of mine that was homeless at one point, and he um watched a lot of people walk by him that he felt like should have gave him a dollar at certain points in time. But he was able to come up with an invention that made him a millionaire, and he bought the place where he was living in, where he was sleeping under. He actually bought the building for himself. And one thing he told me, he was like, he didn't know it at the time, but the exchange of resources, in order for you to be a millionaire, it means you had to pass by a million people and not give them a dollar because it's always an exchange of resources. The only thing that makes people wealthier or more, shall I say, resourceful than others is how they utilize the resources. And our, our goal is not necessarily to become like, you know, like we 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 in this revolutionary stage right now, but we don't know where to go. Controlling the resources is really our number one goal. It should be anyway. And just like uh, you had just mentioned, Calvin, about like how you went to school um, to college based on the scholarship, playing ball. Yeah, so yeah. The office, you either you either gonna be playing ball, you're gonna be military, or you know, folks gonna you know, have some money for you to go to college. Other than that, you really have very few options. So That's right, big boy. You know, to build a community, you know what I'm saying? It takes things like vocation, you know what I'm saying? Where we used to, they were, like my dad's generation, they learned, you know, plumbing. They could learn electrical, welding. You know, they was teaching us typing. You know, I know how to type. That was a, that's a privilege nowadays. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's a skill set that they should be, they easily teach us, you know what I'm saying? We move them to the computers, but they don't teach the courtesy. They don't teach typing anymore. Home ec, you know, I learned how to cook and do certain things in, in home ec. You know what I'm saying? Right. Learn how to cook. I remember those days. And then when they took that out of school, it took away our creativity and ability to create jobs for ourselves, to create our inner wealth, because it was growing. You know what I'm saying? You had generational wealth that was starting to build where black folks was coming up middle class and was actually being successful with jobs and doing this, moving up in management. It was like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Whoa, whoa, where are they getting these skills from? They, You know, these mom and pop uh, situations, Sanford and Son type situations. You know what I'm saying? Where the son's now taking over the business, so and so and sons and this and that. You know, that was revolutionary for us. And they set that down quick. They was able to separate the homes. They was able to, you know, flood it with the crack. They threw the video games and stuff on us along with, you know, these other little devices and different things. And now we got another generation that has no idea of a skill set to actually produce community and wealth. It's all based on some digital thing that could be here today and gone tomorrow. You shut the phones off everybody lost i went a few days without my phone man it felt really good that was like <laughs> the best few days i had in my life like hey you when i'm did you me. shut my phone hey, you... okay look you shut my phone phone off for a couple of days and what i'm involved in now contemporarily i'm up the creek without a paddle that's what i'm trying to tell you <laughs> okay that's besides my point. We we become dependent upon them to provide us with everything. Grocery stores, the food, you know what I'm saying? And as much as we getting back to community gardens and some other stuff, it's not enough. It's just not enough. Where the black farmers at for real? You know what I'm saying? To making sure we got stuff in our community when we need it. My hey, grandfather, you, you know my what? They they had they were sharecropping, but what happened was they used to hook up a Model T Ford to a wagon and bring it into the town and, and, and sell off their vegetables and stuff during the Great Depression. But they were still surviving mm -hmm. and doing what they need to do. You know what I'm uh, saying? The Royal uh, 20s is based off of the, the black experience during the, the um during the twenties. Okay, you're right. Now, 1921, they burned down Black Wall Street. But Black Wall Street, everything that they did down there. The name started with farmers, farmers, because they were farmers. The indigenous Indians were farmers. That's Imagine all they did. Farmers. They 
in the in 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 the nineteen hundreds, uh, right right at the turn of the century with the turn of the railroad, they also had resources, and they had the oil out there. My grandma yeah, had yeah yeah Oklahoma they did had the oil, and he wouldn't let nobody mess with it. It was a lot of, of folks got rich off of oil, got rich off of the minerals, the copper, yeah. the zinc, other stuff because it was on their land. You know what I mean? And it wasn't just the straight haired na uh, natives. It was some kinky haired natives that, that had been yeah. here. You know what I'm saying? That was not enslaved. That didn't have no dealings with the white folks. Didn't want to deal with them. But of course, when the land rush happened, they didn't have no choice because the war was over. You see what I'm saying? Okay. They just finished fighting. Oh, yes. I hear you. And, and it was, the war was over. So it was like, well, what do we do? These folks just rushing up on our land. What do we do? They said, well, this treaty signed. Y'all can go over here. You can have this. This land is my land. This land is your land. Whose land you talking to? Who you singing this song for? This yeah, land is my land. Well, this land your land. From California well, to I'll tell you what. The $5 Indians got a whole lot of that land, too. Right. And what I mean by $5 Indian wasn't really an Indian culture. They say they were Indians. No, they actually paid five dollars to get on the census. Because in the census, okay. 18, the eighteen eighty census, they made all of the kinky haired people. If you had kinky hair west of the Mississippi, they made you register as a Negro. It did not matter okay. what your tribe was. If you was Blackfoot, if you was Comanche, Apache, Muscogee, Osage, it didn't matter. You was gonna register as a Negro if you had kinky hair. So what some of the white folks did. They paid the censors, because they used to go door to door. They gave them $5 to put their name down as a Cherokee. or put their name down as a, 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 a Omaha or whatever. You know what I'm saying? And that's how the $5 Indians came about. And they the ones yeah, that that's American history. Other stuff. That's fact. Okay. Yeah. Now, of course it's fact. That's why I mentioned it. Yes, sir. Right. And you so elaborated on land. it. We actually got land and treaties that we could be claiming. And in my, this is my humble personal opinion, that insurrection was a test because we could have done the same thing as a people. You march on Washington, we can march right up there and tell them to get up. You got to go. Your time's up, bro. Like, this is not what we're doing. We're just doing this the crap now because folks agree. You agree to it. We all, we just agree. We say, okay, I go this nine to five. I punch in this clock. Okay, I accept your education. Okay, I accept your curriculum or what you yeah. want me to, or what you want me to do or what shots you want me to shoot or how you want me to drive this UPS truck or we we agree to do everything what you say, sir. That's what I meant by getting the American education because they have the laws. They wrote the laws. I no, wasn't man, ever in a legislature. The laws are based on the Ten Commandments. <laughs> Okay, but they but they did write the laws. And I'm talking about the Constitution and all that, right? So now the lawyers learn that, and then they can use that to get what they want out of the system. They can use all that. Now that's an education right there. To become a lawyer. I went to the law school for a year. I learned Iraq how to write a, a law exam. You have to do this in order to get through school, in order to get a, a, a JD, a Juris Doctor, or, or get on the bar. Mm -hmm. I, I wanted to do that, but I couldn't do that. That wasn't for me. But I had a year in it. So what I was learning was their laws, because they were the legislators. We have three... Uh, Ways to look at it. Judicial, executive, and legislative. Okay? You got to get past the judicial. Somebody's got to make the law. Somebody's got to enforce them. Okay? That's the way our system is. It's called a democratic system. So you learn it, and you right. use it to, to your advantage. Right. Okay. Now, look, we're going to um, we're gonna take our pause, folks, this evening. We didn't have a, a lively conversation and oh, man. everybody to buy this book here by author C.J. H. Moore, Opportunity, the largest cash heist in American history. 
I've been reading it and it's very interesting. So I want you guys to purchase it. Anybody that hears this and you, you should enjoy yourself because I really enjoyed the other book uh, about uh, what's another book name? It's called uh, Natural Born Gangster. The Legend That's of Chris Bell. Bell. I love that. Okay, now, I want to say this, Ross, Ross Key, because you're getting ready to sign off. Yes, sir. Intelligence ends where spirituality begins. Okay? So, we have to become intelligent in everything we do and where we live, the country we live, wherever country we go in, we have to be intelligent. But spirituality supersedes it all, just like power supersedes it all. That's the ultimate power, spirituality. And what I mean by that is a whole lot of people coming together and thinking the same way. It's unity spiritually. And you have to unify physically before you can do it. Appreciate that. Appreciate well, thank you. Appreciate you coming on. Uh, I want to thank everybody else for coming on. Professor Rob. Yeah, I do too. Professor Rob. You're on mute. Professor Rob. Hey, uh, hey guys. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you this. Thank you for coming on yeah. and having this conversation with me. I didn't expect it to go this way. I didn't expect to have all the technical problems we had in the beginning, but we got it done. Thank you for your input. I really appreciate it. We appreciate you too, brother. So what, what we, Thank you. What we got next? Tuesday, Professor Ra. Well, we we want to uh, go back to that black uh, cultural movement at Cal State Long Beach, uh, but it depends on uh, you know the escalation of the war and the escalation of uh, issues. But uh, we're just gonna have a roundtable discussion on critical issues that affect black people. And I want to focus on the black movement at Cal State Long Beach because I was a part of it, and it was. Uh, a part of the college movements when in the 60s. And that's when BSUs changed their name from Negro Student Union to Black Student Union. And they're still in existence in some places. I mean, they call them Pan-African Student Union or something like that. But still, it, it, it wouldn't have been there if it wasn't for the movement. Uh, that's when people start wearing natural. People were wearing their African uh, clothes and people were hugging each other, calling each other brothers and sisters. And then Cointel Pro came in, and then white folks came in with money and and changed all that. And so, but the point that, you know, but we still have some people that are still hanging on to the movement. You know, almost all the black organizations reached their height during the 60s, the NAACP, the Nation of Islam, the Urban League, uh, uh, OIC, Office of uh, Industrial uh, Center with uh, Reverend Sullivan and uh, <clears throat> Occupational Center, Industrial Occupational Center, uh, Watts of uh, Manufacturing, Watts WLCAC. I mean, I mean, we, I mean, that's just here. We we can go nationwide. First Black Power Conference in St. Louis. Uh, the emergence of Stokely, uh, the emergence of uh, of H. Rap, the, the, the emergence of uh, the US organization, the emergence of the uh, of the Panthers, and they all had different philosophies and ideologies. And uh, for whatever you know, there's a lot of reasons they didn't come together. They start out working together, and then. Uh, they begin to uh, have dissent among each other. But anyway, we're going to talk about that. And, and what you say, well, why? Why? So we learn from them lessons and learn from them mistakes and then try to rebuild the movement. You're not going nowhere without a movement. That's why they call Trump the uh, uh, mega movement, because you're moving people to a consciousness and a reality. Everyone said, well, how come black people can't get together? Well, because they make sure we don't have a charismatic leader to create a movement, and we don't have our people conscious uh, to the level of what you see the value of a movement, 
um, you know, George Floyd movement and, and the uh, <clears throat> Michael Brown movement, Eric Gardner movement, you know, uh, <clears throat> and then, but they they were they they, they didn't laugh. You got to be able to build institutions in that. But anyway, we are we're in we're in a serious struggle uh, with regards. We've always been in a serious struggle, but we uh, have to begin to realize the importance of education, our mobilization, organization, confrontation, and transformation. Uh, those are the issues, and you know, black male female relationships are at all time low. Life expectancy for black people and infant mortality. These are things that we need to study and, and get information about if we're going to solve our inner inner group problem. You know, and so uh, we're going to be discussing critical issues like that. Now, I hope everyone come back with some ideas. And critical issues or ways in which they think we can uplift our people, uplift our children, and uplift ourselves to a consciousness of of, of knowing who we are, so we and, and where we are. So that's what's happening next month. Too. Well, I like to say this: I'm glad that opportunities, large cast action American history, spurred on this uh, talk mm-hmm. with all the issues in, involved, because there's a lot of issues. See, you can read the book and get out of it what you want out of it, but there's a broad spectrum of issues in that book. And of course, if you read it uh, word by word, verbatim, like I had to do 15, 16 times, and then things would jump out at you, because I wrote it, things would jump out at you. I, I'm concerned about everything that everybody discussed tonight and the issues I try to address them as well as I can when I write these books. Because I write about black people. I don't write about anything else. I told you that the last time. I write about our plight. I knew where I grew up. I grew up in Compton. My parents moved here in 56. I've been here ever since. And I tell you, I'm 70 years old, Okay. That's been a long time ago. So I've seen a whole lot of stuff happen. And I've seen them come and I've seen them go. I saw the egotistical ones and I saw the ones that didn't have enough confidence. I saw them. So I just write about them. That's all. And it's it's great writing. Appreciate you, brother. Thank you. Thank you. So next week for our show, we have Brother Damian McCallman coming back on. I think this will be his fourth visit with us. And the topic is youth development, gaining their trust and admiration. So that should be very inspirational. So I'm going I'm to say Conscious Corner and each one teach one. Have a good evening. Good evening, Roger Key. <laughs>